Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers today. How are you, my friend? So glad to be here. And maybe you are wondering what happened to my teacup. Well, what we are fixing you today demands a mug, something heavier. And this is a mug that a viewer had made, had made for me a long time ago. And it's got a picture of me with my name on both sides. And it's perfect for the hot apple cider we're fixing today that you fix in a slow cooker. So that's the reason for a little bit different kind of, you know, way to drink. Uh, you, want, you, want a, you want a mug, you want a thick mug that'll contain the heat of an of a apple cider. I'm going to make that with Stephanie. But of course, before that happens, I am so thrilled to bring to you a ministry I never heard of in my life until I got a book about it. And I've been in the ministry all my life. My grandfather, my dad, my husband, my son, all pastors. I know the ministry very well. And I love it. And I love the missionaries that come through. And I love the unusual types of ministries that the Lord puts together. And he calls someone to perform it. But I bet you've never thought of this one. I never did, but this book grabbed me because the name of it is Conversations with the Voiceless. And it says, Finding God's Love in Life's Hardest Questions. And that is very true. The author is here, John Wessels, along with his wife, Gail. Now, this is what this uh, title means, uh, Conversations with the Voiceless, because they have the most unique ministry I've ever come across so far. And they go from town to town, hospital to hospital, uh, rehabilitation centers, uh, wherever God leads them. And John and Gail sing and give scripture and talk to people who are comatose. And most experts tell us that hearing is the last thing to go. And there are some miracles in this book. And Johnny Erickson Tata is the one who wrote the foreword for it. So I, I just really believe that you are going to have your heart grabbed as mine was when I learned about this ministry, and I'm so glad they're here. And um, I'm anxious for you to meet them. And it just offers you hope for what seems to be totally hopeless, okay? All right, I'm going to just Steph join Stephanie in a minute, but I want to remind you we are viewer-supported. And without your help supporting us, we could not bring these ministries to you, these uh, various authors, experts on every kind of topic that you, you could imagine. We've been here about 20 years now and um, haven't run out of topics yet or great guests that the Lord sends us. So in order to support this ministry, you can use our 800 number, which is on your screen right now, 1-800-229-0059. Or join me uh, by mail, Homekeepers, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. And either way, this is what I believe. If the Lord prompts you to do it, do it. And when that happens, every single need will be met. And it's really that simple. Sometimes we try to complicate giving, but it's not. Giving is all through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and I practice it. And it's a blessing in my life. And you know what? If you do it long enough and you feel that prompting, even to give a waitress a little bigger tip. You just do it. You just you, do I've it. I've learned it. You get it. the unction. You, just, you don't think about it. Yeah. You don't question the Lord. Like, really? No, just do it. Yeah. Yep. There was one thing one time I was praying about. I mean, I prayed and prayed and prayed. And it was a situation with a Christian school. And one day the Lord spoke to me and said, all right, you prayed. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And I wrote the biggest check I've ever written. But you know what? It, it didn't really take. bother me mm -hmm. because I have that knew. confidence mm -hmm. in the Lord. What he said, he will do. Yes. Case closed. Amen. Oh. Amen. Now, 
Oh my gosh. Audience, I wish you need this. They could, I wish you could smell this. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. I call this fancy apple cider. Fancy. fancy. Yeah. We, you and I went to a Christmas little get together last year of a friend. We mm -hmm. had dinner and a movie. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things from the evening was the yes. apple cider. Yeah. And I couldn't get enough of it, which Mm -hmm. It's high in carbs, so I have to be careful. But. This, this, now, this is, a, <laughs> this is slow cooker. However, yeah. I have in the past just put it on with a lot of cloves and yep. stuff in it just for the, just for yep. the aroma. Yep. So yep. what do we do? I'm, okay, so um, I slice I have the oranges. Crampa, yeah, carefully, very carefully. I have ap um, apple cider. You know, this is just taking it up a notch. You know, you could easily just pour some of this in a cup and serve it, but... Why not be fancy and just kick it up a notch and make your whole house smell so delicious? There is something about slow cooking oh, gosh. that mingles yes. the various yes. um, flavors together. I concur. We have a little bit of brown sugar mm -hmm. that we're going to dissolve in there. Okay. Can I take this lid off? I sure. Just smell it. Oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I have cheesecloth. I'm going to cut a little cheesecloth. Tell the people where you buy it. Uh, I, she got it at Publix, so at a grocery okay. store, at um, a restaurant store, mm -hmm. anything like that. I have cinnamon sticks. We're going to put two cinnamon sticks. Those are potent. Oh. And I have whole cloves and whole allspice. Mm -hmm. You want about a teaspoon of each. Um, what exactly is allspice? It's all the spices. No, I don't <laughs> <laughs> But, uh... It's Pepper. used more like when Thanksgiving rolls around yeah. and a lot of pumpkin yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. You have to ask well, me these things beforehand I'll, I'll so I can Google. So a teaspoon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you just take your cheesecloth and you tie it up. This is so, we're just trying to help you. Super simple stuff. Yeah. Have some friends over for the holidays. Have some cookies. Or have, yeah, we've we've shown you some Got peppercorns desserts. in it? I'm not, so. is that what it says? Well, it's got other things. Yeah. So you just tie the cheesecloth up. And then you don't have to start trying to drain it out with some kind of a right. sieve, right? You drop that right in there, okay? And then you simply put oranges, mm -hmm. put it in your crock pot, uh, or put it, you, you know, one more. yeah. Turn it on for a few yeah, hours. Yeah, go ahead and throw this in. These, yeah, all yeah, of that it. Skin it's all flavor. Greatest. I mean, how, and then, okay, here. There we go. Here we go. Here's my fa Here's my mug. Mm -hmm. Here's my mug. We got to share. share. Yeah, can, can they read that? Oh, yeah. Dad's, Dad's favorite. favorite. <laughs> now, who bought that? I did. No. <laughs> In other words, your, your dad didn't. I bought him one that says Dad, and mm -hmm. then I bought one that says Dad's favorite. Yes. So my siblings will know. Friends, I really highly go. recommend at least oh put this gosh. on the stove and let it smell. Oh. Oh, there's nothing. That is like a little piece of heaven in a glass. That's the best I've ever had in my life. It's the really best cider I've ever had. A little warm, but <laughs> yeah, it's oh Duh. man. Oh my gosh, it's delicious. Super We're in simple. Florida here, and we have our first cold front. It's it like down 70s. To 70s. It's in the 70s it got when to I got 72. up. It was 68 when I got up this morning, oh. and I thought I had died and gone Wonderful. to heaven. So apple it's cider wonderful. and soup today. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you want this recipe, it's absolutely free. That information's coming up. And uh, take note of that. And then right after you get that information, you're going to meet my new best friends, and that's John and Gail Wessels. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. What a joy for me to introduce to you John and Gail Wessels, and they are the founders of Precious Oil Ministries, right? That's correct. And um, I, just, I just want you to know that this has had a profound effect on me. And to think that Jesus loves us so much and he's in the details. You know, people will often say the devil's in the details. Uh-uh, he is. Yeah. And it's like he looked down from heaven and said, you know, those people who are comatose and he severe head injuries, his spirit can still reach them. So he 
said, John and Gail, will you do this? And mm. you did. Mm. So welcome to the show. Um, give me a little background, John, on how just how this all started. Where in the world would you get the idea <laughs> to go take your guitar? In? And let me say, uh, we're going to put the website up that I checked out some of your music and it's, it's good, well, good music. There's CDs mm -hmm. that they can buy and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, so you're a musician who you can really play guitar and you can really do these things and you go in and pray for some or play and sing for someone that most people would say you're wasting your time. Yeah. How'd that happen? Well, it, we were at a season where we'd, I'd been a worship leader in churches. I traveled and did concerts. Uh, we did coffee houses, out, ministry outreaches. And we came to a period in time where we really sensed God was saying there's a change coming. And so we took a season just to seek the Lord. We shut everything else out and began to seek the Lord. One night, I was woken out of a dead sleep at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And that doesn't happen to me a lot. <laughs> and I just, I felt like the Lord was saying, come spend some time with me. And as I went out to pray and spend time with him, the Lord gave me a vision, which I've never had visions before. But I saw someone lying in a coma. It was a vision of someone lying in a comatose state. And he put on my heart that as long as that person is alive and breathing, that they have a spirit and his spirit can reach their spirit. And he challenged me to be faithful, to take my guitar into the room and just worship him and he said if you just worship me because we all know that God inhabits the praises of his people mm -hmm. and bring my presence into the room I by my spirit he said will reach down and I'll save some I will heal some and I will take some home and we've seen all three of those things happen after that vision what what did you think where do I go find well, uh, well, someone I was, who's First, I was afraid to tell my wife. I thought she's going to think <laughs> I've lost my mind, you know. Yeah. And God had given me two words. It was music therapist. And mm -hmm. so I kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit about telling Gail that next morning. And I thought she was going to tell me I was crazy. And when I told her the whole story, she said, I think that's the Lord. Wow. And, of course, we don't. You know, that would have to be the Lord. Yes, it would. You're not going to come <laughs> up with that by yourself. No. <laughs> Yeah, and so we didn't know where you find someone in a coma or anything about it, but the Lord said, just trust him, he would guide and direct us. Mm -hmm. Okay, wh where was the first person? And I, I would think there would be a few barriers you would have to get through mm -hmm. in, in a rehabilitation center or hospital, whatever, to get to those people. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the instructions I felt from the Lord was to make sure I always get approval and permission. I think sometimes as Christians, we think we can just go with the, you know, God's direction and break Bingo. all the rules. Yeah. I've seen it happen in prisons and in <laughs> hospitals. And, and so I was very careful to do that. But what had happened is um, we had a, a, it was Gail's uh, brother had come to us a couple days after we had had this vision. And he asked me if I believed in healing. And coming from him, I thought that was a strange question. I said, yeah, I said, God still heals today. And sometimes he uses normal people like us to pray for people. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, my wife's cousin really needs a healing. And I said, well, what's the matter with him? He said, well, he was in a bad car accident in upstate New York and he's in a coma. Well, my heart began to pound. Mm -hmm. And we had just moved to this area called Milford, Pennsylvania, near where he lived. He said, would you go visit him? And I knew this was the Lord opening the door. And I said, sure. I said, where is he? He said he's right here in, in Milford, Pennsylvania. One of the largest head injury facilities at the time on the East Coast was in Milford, Pennsylvania, a little town of 1,200 people. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we thought God had us there for a totally different reason, but he had us in the right place yeah. at the right time. Was he in a hospital? He was in a head in, a regular head injury facility. Was he, he was comatose. Yeah. And how did you get in to see him? I well, mean, they asked walking me, in with a guitar, you'd be a little bit Well, I just, noticeable. we went to visit first, mm -hmm. and so... I went into, we, Gail and I, uh, because we had permission from the family to go visit him, we just signed in as a regular guest. And I thought, well, let me check this out, and then I will talk to the volunteer, uh, director of volunteers. So, um, but what had happened is I really didn't know what anybody in a coma really looked like or what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And one thing I had forgotten about is how weak stomached I am. I'm not good in hospitals or nursing homes. and. No um, blood. <laughs> yeah, so I was all excited because I had this call of God, and I, I remember walking into the room, and uh, you know th there was this MTV blaring on the screen. They had uh, pornographic pictures on the wall to try to stimulate this 18-year-old boy 
Uh, there was a rabbit's foot hanging on the oh, wall. Oh, my goodness. And a crucifix. So it kind of gave you the whole gamut of desperation. Gives you the creeps. Yeah, we'll take yeah. anything. And then when I turned to look at this fella, uh, half of his brain had been missing from the accident. He was hooked up to all sorts of tubes, uh, very distended his arms. And I had planned on what I was going to do and what I was going to say. I could not open my mouth. Mm -hmm. In fact, my wife says you turn green when you walked mm -hmm. in that room. And I remember going to the bed, saying a quick prayer, and leaving. And I walked out the hallway crying, mm -hmm. saying, Lord, you've got the wrong person this for the job. This is a big one, yeah, big this, job. This isn't me. I can't do this. And I felt the Lord speak to my heart and say, if I thought you could do this, I would have never sent you. Yeah, because you can't. Yeah, but in your weakness, I'll make you strong. Yeah. What did you feel when you walked in there? Well, there is. there was such a sense of sadness oppression in these places because oh, there's no it, it visitors must have been gross. Mm -hmm. there's no visitors there's an element you know the smells the ventilators just there it, it's almost walking into you know there's many mission fields we think of um, mission fields in other countries to the poor and mm -hmm. the needy but these are mission fields of people that are totally forgotten yeah and so often i'm reminded that even if we give a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord, our reward will will not Absolutely. be denied yeah. us. And and I have found that over all these 30 plus years that we've done this ministry, there is something so beautiful about stepping outside of ourselves into the suffering of others. Thanks God. Mm -hmm. Now you eventually did sing to this gentleman. I did, yeah. I did. Because uh, I read your whole book. Is this one of them where there was actually some response well, in this particular, this was the room where I think what you were talking about, but yeah. this particular fella, the day I went in there with my guitar and got my guitar out, again, I was very woozy and wasn't sure about mm -hmm. it, but as soon as we started to worship the Lord, the presence of the Lord filled that room like no other service I had I ever been in before. I don't doubt it. And the Lord just show, showed me how close his heart is to these broken mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And as we began to worship, his hands were gnarled up and he just began to relax. Mm -hmm. And you could see just the peace of God come over him. And I assumed that God was mm -hmm. going to heal him on the spot. And, you know, maybe I could write a book and travel the country and tell people about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what happened. You know, in these instances, it's hard for us to absolutely believe his ways are higher than our ways. Mm -hmm. His thoughts are higher than our ways. And he has a purpose mm -hmm. in all of these things. We do have the website up for the Precious Oil Ministries. Uh, the name of the book is Conversations with the Voiceless. You can get it there. I'm sure you can get it um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of those. I, I just highly, highly recommend it because we'll just uh, skim the surface. Actually, um, I want to, I want to move forward a little bit. Then maybe we can come back because I want to talk about your own experience. That how many years from the time you began the ministry and you you played and sang and gave scriptures to people that you don't know for sure what went on inside. Uh, and then you lost your own son, which only intensified everything you were doing and believed in. And it gave it meaning that I'm not sure you would have wanted. No. No, we, it, it, it created a whole new dimension to what you were doing. Yeah, it was about five years into the ministry when that, when that took place. And it's not something you sign up for, but if you hang on long enough, you'll see God's hand. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about John Samuel. I like his name. <laughs> well, uh, he was our firstborn son, and we just were goo goo ga, -ga like any parent would be mm -hmm. over their firstborn son. And we did everything with him. And from day one, I mean, the day we brought him home from the hospital, we got the guitar out and began to worship to thank God for this boy. And it was amazing. I remember the first time I strummed my guitar, his little head that he's not supposed to be able to turn, turned and looked across the room to see where that sound that he had probably heard while he was in his mother's womb all no those times in the hospital. <laughs> and so he was a precious boy. He would come to the hospitals with us. And in fact, we always kid because he said, Mommy, when I get older, I'm going to go with Daddy to the hospitals and you're going to stay home and make supper for us. Home oh. <laughs> So he had the ministry all planned. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, now, he had a battle with cancer, is that right? Yes, he did. Pulmonary blastoma. 
and um, he he kind of knew he was going to go to heaven. He's, he's only five years old, right? He was, he was three. three at the time. When he was diagnosed, he was three years old. They thought it was uh, no, solidified pneumonia, and it was a very, very rare tumor. The day we thought he was better, we were going home. They called us in and said we don't. The nurses and everyone were crying. They said, we don't know how to tell you this. Leukemia would be a good diagnosis. Um, but he's got something so rare, even the American Cancer Society had never heard of. And our world changed that day. But I think the Bible talks about the faith of a child. Mm -hmm. And you told him after the chemo and all, said, okay, you're going to get better now. Your hair's going to grow. And what did he say to you? Well, we had just finished nine rounds of chemo, two major surgeries, and they said it, it looked like we got it. And that day, we, I packed him up from the hospital. I couldn't wait to sign the final release papers. And I got in the car, and I was buckling him into his seatbelt. And I said, John Samuel, I said, uh, you're going to be all better. I said, they're going to remove your Hickman catheter in two weeks. Your hair's going to grow back. And he looked directly at me and said, Daddy, I'm not all better, but that's okay. And I said, what, what do you mean, John Samuel? No, the doctor said you're going to be okay. okay. And he never responded to that. Maybe he'd already, you know, yeah. seen something. Yeah. Um, one, one of your, um, just the way you expressed in the book really grabbed me. That when he was gone, you had never known such pay, pain or peace. Hmm. Never known such peace. I kind of get that in the home going of uh, a saint. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be much, much harder with a child. Mm -hmm. But you really kind of summed it up. The, yeah. We don't sorrow as others who have no hope. No. Because you're going to see him again. Yes. That's right. And all, but it does not diminish not at all. the pain of a father and a mm -hmm. mother. Mm -hmm. does it doesn't. Did that just kind of intensify what you were doing? Did it give it more meaning or did you go through a period of not so sure? No, we had people calling and asking if we were going to continue doing what we're doing. I remember skeptics that would sit back and mm -hmm. wonder if we were going to continue even with the Lord because mm -hmm. of what had happened. And it, did, it made us stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gave us an authority that we never asked for. But now we had that we could go in and sympathize mm -hmm. and comfort with the comfort that we'd experienced from the Lord through this, these people that we were ministering to in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So because I think sometimes we have a tendency to just want to give the right answers. But if we, mm -hmm. if we don't know what people are going through, mm -hmm. we shouldn't pretend we do because that hurts more than it helps. Mm -hmm. I think. If you've just joined me, I am talking to John and Gail Wessels, who John has written Conversations with the Voiceless. And... I've been in television a long, long time, and it's a delight to put a spotlight on ministries that perhaps people are not aware of, but I've never, ever, ever heard of one like this. And the website is on your screen, and if the Lord just really kind of gives you a sense that you should help out, you can do that through that website and also get the book, which is titled Conversations with the Voiceless. Now, um, you have had some really uh, dramatic responses and turn turnarounds mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. uh, with this. You start music. I understand that. Uh, music is therapy. There's mm -hmm. no yeah. question. I come from a family of musicians and uh, there's, there's no question even everybody ought to give their kid a few music lessons and help them with math for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a given. Mm -hmm. But the presence of the Lord is what makes the difference. And I am appalled to learn what you told us earlier, that they've got pornographic pictures up to try to stimulate an 18-year-old boy in a, in a coma. Uh, but it was also interesting, as you continue to tell the story, that when you started worshiping, everything changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have just about three minutes left. Tell me about, I can't remember his name, but one who um, you spoke to them spoke to him about bitterness. Now, here's somebody, you're not sure he's hearing you. Correct. Uh, but the Lord uh, put it on your heart to mention bitterness towards mm -hmm. something, and, and he began to really kind of demonstrate that he, he was getting it. Yes, yes. I was, I was actually in a room with this first fellow I was telling you about when the Lord put on my heart 
to go to this fellow, we'll call him Bob, his bedside, and uh, just began, he spoke to me about, speak to him about bitterness. Now, I, I don't know if I'm coming from left field. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to step out by faith. So I began to speak to him. And I said, the Lord's just wanted me to talk to you about bitterness. And if you have mm -hmm. bitterness in your heart, and I shared Psalm 51, created me a clean heart, O God. Mm -hmm. And I started playing that old familiar chorus, created me a clean heart, O God. And as I began to play that, something began to rise up in him. And he was thrashing and he was, you know, just, it was, it was definitely mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And I was scared at the mm -hmm. time, you know. And I just, the more he thrashed, the more I just closed my eyes and sang. Mm -hmm. And then wow. during that time. Wish I could have been there. Oh, <laughs> it was during that time, all of a sudden he just, he was thrashing and sitting up and he just fell back in bed. And it, he looked like a little lamb. It was just the peace of God had come over him. In fact, a nurse walked in right after that and said to me, what did you do to him? He's been ornery all day. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, I just, you know what I want to happen here? Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of people are hearing this story. Mm -hmm. And I just pray that they'll look totally different now as somebody who's, who's in a coma, somebody who has a head injury yes. and all, they're still that person that God loves, adores, and wants to redeem. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've had people come out of comas and told us that they heard everything going on. This fellow that I told you about, Bob, as I prayed the sinner's prayer, he told me when he came out of his coma that he prayed the sinner's prayer with me. And I had no did, idea. He did come out. He how did, much of a, how much did he regain when he? He came out where he, he could slur some of his speech, but he could clearly answer yes or no questions. And then shortly after that, he got moved to a different facility, mm -hmm. and I've totally lost contact because of the HIPAA laws and things. They couldn't mm -hmm. tell me anything about him. But. but one thing that was kind of neat is he w we were surprised. It was back during the days of the answering machines, and we got a voicemail when we came home one day, and it was no Bob <laughs> wanting John to know he could talk now. Mm -hmm. He was out of the coma. Yeah. And I had been promising I that this. I was going to take him for ice cream when, when he got better. And that was what the phone call was about. And I actually got to go put him in a wheelchair and, and wheel him to the Ooh, local this ice is, cream. Oh, this is great. And we're out of time. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. But I don't know if you've been getting goosebumps like I have, but I am so thankful that God sent these people to us and we can hear their stories and we can tell them to you. And uh, hopefully there'll be a lot of good come out of this program. Uh, maybe a lot of you have friends and loved ones in a coma. I guess I would say be very careful what you say around them yeah. and fill the room with praise and uh, worship to Jesus. It will help them. So join me next time. Remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTM Programs and then on Homekeepers.